speaking of systems, if I could, let me show you yeah. how I originally got into this. Please. In the late 80s, I had read Brianne Eisler's book, The Chalice and the Blade, and she mm -hmm. talks mm -hmm. basically about two systemic models of society, what she calls the dominator model and the partnership model. And I was explaining it to a group of ninth grade boys and girls in a traditional public high school and English class. And I'm telling them that this is one of the systems that I'm gonna demonstrate to you with stick figures, because I can't draw very well. And I showed them this drawing. I just put this on the board. And I said, guys, think about this. Don't answer from your head, answer from your heart. And tell me from your heart, what does it feel like to be this person in that relationship? Hmm. Really tell me how it feels. And they told me, and then as time would allow over the next several years, I gave the same talk to many, many, many different groups of people from young people to business people, to adults, to parent teacher organizations. And I have a file full probably of a thousand words at this point that I got when I said, how does it feel to be that person in that relationship? And here is a sampling of many words that I got. Mm -hmm. And when I said to the kids and to many other people, where do you experience that? School, home, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, church, uh, sports, business, from my boss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Basically, it is the culture most of us have learned. It's the systemic way of living that we've learned. And I want you to pay attention here. I'm not good at reading backwards. I'm going to point out a couple <laughs> of things here and here. These are words from adults and kids and everybody else. Mm. We're currently concerned in the broader world of education with the overwhelming anxiety and depression that we are seeing in young people. Mm -hmm. It is being blamed on COVID. And <laughs> I guess in a way, all these people that I've interviewed for years and years and years are blaming it on the system. Right. Because if the system operates like that, and this is how people feel, which is emotionally unsafe mm -hmm. with a variety of different hurtful feelings, we need to take a different look at the system. And I love Rianne Eisler because I believe she's written so much in this regard, though I'm not quite sure she gets it in terms of education because she was educated right. this way. Yeah, yeah. And but she helped me change as a teacher. And mm. when I started talking to ninth grade kids, who, by the way, nobody in the world is more honest if you give them the freedom to be the ninth grade kids. And so I said to them, the other system that she describes in her book, she calls a partnership system. And it looks more like this. Mm -hmm. So, Tell me from your heart, how does it feel to be this person in that system and that relationship? And where do you experience that? And very few had experienced it. Right. And except primarily with their friends was what the kids would say. Some adults, when I speak to groups of adults, experience it with their partners. Many do not. Mm. Right. Some experience it with colleagues at work. Many do not. Mm -hmm. And almost no one experienced it in school. 
I've yeah. heard a couple of stories of caring teachers, one-on-one -on -one conversations, but then when I say to the person, was it like that in the classroom? No, it was not. And because teachers are required, the number one thing that teachers are evaluated on is, quote, controlling their class in the traditional right, right. system. So they are almost required to be like that. But when I asked, how does this feel? Mm -hmm. This is what I got. I'm talking about thousands of answers over 30 years now, every time I give mm -hmm. this talk. Well, look at this list. Which group of people is more capable of learning easily? The disempowered group or the empowered group? The disrespected group or the respected group? The sad, scared, and lonely people or the happy, safe, and involved people? And over all these years, as I've talked about it, and of course I do this for every new student coming into our school, and I say, you're going from a school where you lived like this to a school where you're going to live like this, and it's going to take you a while to really feel that. Mm. But anytime you don't feel it, call me on it, or come and tell me if you're mm. feeling it, because our school is committed to this. I believe all mm -hmm. Sudbury schools operate like this if they're truly functional Sudbury schools. And I believe it's a much healthier environment holistically for children to grow mm -hmm. up. It's my experience that kids who live like that and also live like that at home, because many of our parents put these stick figures on their refrigerator and I tell them, you have to be willing to give up the power to become a more empowered family and mm. allow your children to call you on it the way I allow them to call me on it at school, the way I want them to call me on it. Because I tell them, mm -hmm. I want to live like this in relationship where we respect each other and where we learn together. Mm -hmm. My experience is, and you know, Danny Greenberg wrote a lot about this, my idol, Danny Greenberg, who was one of the prime founders of the whole Sudbury movement, wrote a lot about how when he would teach math to kids when they finally really wanted to learn math, he could teach the entire elementary school curriculum in 20 hours where they totally got it. Because I believe the system creates emotionally safe, respected, empowered, happy children. Happy people can learn anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> why do you think it takes so long to teach that math curriculum that he can teach in 20 hours? Why does it take a thousand hours in traditionals? Because the kids don't wanna learn it when they're teaching it. That's and right. we That's don't right. believe that they're capable of deciding when they want to learn it. And that mm -hmm. is part of this disempowering belief system. As I've talked to lots of people and lots of kids about this, I have come to believe as they do that there is a continuum. At the far mm -hmm. end of the continuum is just very gentle things like Oh, little Johnny, let me tie your shoe for you because we're in a hurry and I want to get out. Whereas Johnny feels good about himself when he ties his shoes. And for heaven's sakes, mom or teacher, you can wait three minutes. And I had to learn that. I can wait mm -hmm. while Johnny ties his shoes because that's so empowering. And so the subtle ways that we do this to children are, have been a big topic of discussion the last few years with our group and parents, all mm. the way to the very domineering ways that we do it and autocratic ways that we do it in traditional schooling. This is the Agentic Schools Vodcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living 
is more important than their academic skills. What makes education possible is the satisfaction of psychological needs. So that is what these schools have in common with all others. What makes a school agentic is satisfying those needs particularly well. I'm your host, Don Berg.